so it's uh, called the, the uh, Wednesday, February 15th, 2023, Capital Funding Protection Committee meeting to order. Uh, before we get to the roll call, I do want to notice uh, two new members to this committee. So we have Commissioner Alexis Hill joining us via Teams today. Uh, we also have Councilman Miguel Martinez here in the room uh, to join us uh, in this committee. So welcome. Uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and call the roll call. Devin Reese. Here. Charlene Bybee. Here. Paul Anderson. Here. Alexis Hill. Here. Jeannie Herman. Justin Ivory. Here. Andrew Diss. Here. Elise Bunkowski. Chris Cobb. Here. Dave Solaro. Here. And Miguel Martinez. Here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that will take us to item 2.01, which is approval of the minutes for the December 8th, 2022 meeting of the Capital Funding Protection Committee. Move to approve. Second. All right, I've got a motion by Reese, a second by Anderson. Is there any public comment on this item? There's no public comment. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? carries unanimously. That will then take us to item 2.02, which is information and discussion on the anticipated cadence and workload for future meetings of the Capital Funding Protection Committee for 2022-2023 school year. Mr. Searcy. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Solero. For the record, Adam Searcy, Chief Operating Officer for the Washington County School District. Uh, this is our regular update uh, for upcoming meetings and topics, just really to keep everybody on pace with what we're working towards and what we're planning into the future since we meet every other month sometimes. So skipping ahead of today's agenda, of course, we'll look at April. We meet again every other month, usually in the even numbered months. Um, we'll likely hear an update on our facility modernization plan. This is ongoing work um, that this committee's heard updates on a couple times in the past. We anticipate bringing that back several times more before it's done. Second up, central, central transportation yard improvements. This has been our, in our CIP for several years and uh, we've recently initiated design. Um, this committee has approved funding. We've moved forward with con consultants. So we'll give you a significant update in April on that. Um, we'll also hear a significant update on the W. Smith CTE Academy tonight, somewhat in anticipation of a potential budget augmentation action item in April. Um, and then our annual five-year CIP, we like to bring that uh, five-year CIP to the committee in April so that it can be incorporated into the district's overall budget um, in May and June. So that will be a pretty significant uh, item. Again, it's, it's a CIP, so uh, it has uh, varying degree of specificity, but it does have some significant projects. We'll look forward to discussing them in April. Um, oh, and then lastly, a review of agreed upon procedures. That's gonna be a standing item really until it's completed. We'll hear more about that tonight. Okay, um, and stop me if you wanna talk about any of these a little bit further, but moving into June, you'll see a couple of those items again, the annual capital renewal plan that's as opposed to the CIP is kind of the larger scale. This is going to be the one year capital renewal plan where we're getting pretty granular. You'll see past capital renewal plans tonight in our accountability report item. So that'll be for FY24. Possible action on the transportation yard improvements project. If things go according to plan. Um, we potentially fund that in FY24 and initiate construction shortly after July 1 or bidding and and moving that project forward. Um, similarly, Bond Middle School, we've heard about that, we've acted on that, we've pr uh, proceeded with design on that. It was an initial funding allocation, partial design phase funding allocation, so um, anticipating a significant update and potential supplemental budget action item in June, and then a similar semi-standing, semi-regular update on the facility modernization plan. Just a placeholder to keep everybody on the same wavelength of where we're going and what we anticipate talking about. So I'll get a little less specific going forward. August, um, we have long talked about, or actually we've initiated design. Uh, we've talked to this committee about a potential new elementary school in North Spanish Springs in the Stonebrook area community. 
We'll likely bring that back in August for an update on design and an analysis on the potential need, um, potential construction funding. We'll see where we're at in August, but that's on our radar there. Um, moving into September, we, you know, it's every even numbered month. Usually that falls right on fall break. So historically we'll slide that a week sooner. So that's why it says September. That literally would be the date, um, potentially if we need to revisit that elementary school. Also at that time, we think we may be at a point where we need to talk specifically about what the construction phase of Vaughn might look like um, from a schedule and budget standpoint. So I've got that placeholder on the look ahead. Um, and then into December, we'll be nearly where we are again today with our annual accountability report, looking back at the calendar year. Um, now we're moving into foreseeing specific projects that have come out of the facility modernization plan, potentially being right for individual action. That's why you see that funding allocation stemming from the facility modernization plan. So that's kind of how we envision that proceeding forward. Not a ton of specificity on here. Again, just to give you a sense of the tone and the pacing that we're looking for. And again, possible action, depending on where we're at, we could bring something forward in September, December to bring an initial uh, construction package uh, to the field in 2020. That would be 2024 at that point. So just a lengthy look ahead. Those are the major projects that are known and anticipated on our agenda at this time. It's sometimes uh, helpful to just kind of keep in touch with the committee and, and the direction of the overall CIP through this item. All right, are there any questions about that from Mr. Searcy? Seeing none, thank you, sir. That will take us on to item 2.03, which is a presentation, discussion, and possible action to recommend the Washington County School District Board of Trustees accepts the 2022 Capital Improvement Program Annual Accountability Report. And I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Searcy. Sure, as I'm transitioning uh, share screens here, uh, just give me one moment and I am going to turn the floor over uh, to the fine ladies over my shoulder. I'll let them introduce themselves. <laughs> Thank you. I just have to use the right name. Yeah. Right? Don't forget. <laughs> Don't forget. Yeah. forget. Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Polson, Director of Planning and Design for the School District. And I'm Tammy Zerman, the Chief Facilities Management Officer for the district. And Teresa has really been the one to put all of this information together in planning, and that's why I'm going to let her take over and, and manage the, the slide projection. Thank you. She's my wing woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. I'm going to just start out by talking about our um, our data gallery, which is our one of our pages on our website that you can get uh, most of the information that we're going to be talking about today. But specifically, I'll be discussing the capital renewal program, our major projects, and our energy uh, program as well. So this is our building home uh, web page and uh, lots of information again on our capital renewal program, our new projects, but specifically I wanted to highlight, um, you get information on uh, the zoning committee, its role and its function um, in capital projects, as well as our naming committee, and of course this committee as well. Um, but specifically I want to highlight also the quarterly reports that are shown on this page. Um, they are basically a snapshot um, of our current capital projects that are underway. Um, this report is put together by communications in conjunction with capital projects and it gives you um, what's happened in the past three months on those particular projects and what's coming up in the next three months on those projects. Um, our energy efficiency um, dashboard that we have on our website is managed by um, Jason Geddes who's our sustainability manager and on this page you can find anything and everything about our utilities throughout the whole school district. So you can pull up any site, you can um, see the use and the cost of gas, water, power. You can pull up multiple sites, which is kind of nice. You can, so you can compare sites. We often oftentimes can catch problems on similar schools. If you know, one uh, is using way more power than the other, we can kind of take a look at that. This particular clip shows the um, solar use at uh, AACT and um, the savings that we're seeing from that. So it's a really good source of energy efficiency information. If, if I yes, can ask a please. question. Um, I, 
pick wonder on this um, <coughs> since a lot of the schools are using geothermal power is yep. that one of the data points that you also have on this site that is not on there right now but um, certainly something that we can probably take a look at yeah okay that's thank not you. recorded in any way but we can see how we might be able to do that okay yeah. thank you sure um, this slide is about our uh, three-year McKinstry um, energy audit that we uh, initiated about well back in 2018 many of you have probably already heard about this audit because it's been going on for a while but we hired McKinstry to do this energy audit for us to um, identify energy product projects um, so that we could save some energy and um, they had identified a number of things for us to do mainly like lighting retrofits HVAC control um, irrigation controls water savers on um, plumbing fixtures that type of thing so we've been working on those projects for quite some time and um, this slide really shows the results of that we have looked at um, the final reports from that and we have now saved about 1.6 million dollars um, since 2018 on our energy bill so this is really kind of a huge win for the district and uh, we'll continue to look at those types of projects moving forward with with all of our partners so So our capital renewal program, um, and I just want to kind of point out that capital re renewal basically means major maintenance projects, and that's what this program is. Uh, we often get asked how we prioritize these projects because we have so many of them. <laughs> it's flooring, roofing, carpet, concrete, railings, everything you can think of in a school. So um, those projects are prioritized by um, our assessment uh, department. They go out on, on an annual basis they inspect all of our schools, all of the systems within those schools, um, as well as um, coordinating with our maintenance department, you know, about how many calls we get at certain sites all the time and, you know, what the major problems are. So all of that information is, is compiled and gathered and put into our facility condition index system, and that creates really our priority for us for that next following year. This is an example here of Agnes Risley School. It's a, again, one of those um, are on this website. You can pull up any school and see what the anticipated um, maintenance costs are at that school and the projects. If you select any of those line items, you can drill down and see the actual projects that um, are needed at that site. As well on that site, you will see past project bidding results. So this is another example of a project at Agnes Risley last year. It was for drinking fountains. It lists all of the contractors that bid on that project and the uh, lowest awarded bidder. Yeah. Um, can you explain on the um, on the right hand side there with Agnes Frisley? Mm -hmm. um, give us give me some examples of expired and unserviceable at a two million dollar two point eight million dollar cost. That would be a, probably a really huge list of items. Um, I specifically don't have any. Of in mind that I'm aware of, but obviously, I mean, I'm assuming there's probably a lot of HVAC type projects, could be electrical, it could be a wide range of things, but the total of those equals $2 million. Okay, and when you say yeah. unserviceable, those are replacement, probably they right. can't be serviced to can't be serviced repair. Or, or probably can't find parts. Because the serviceable obviously would be the repaired one. Right. I was just trying to look at the two categories. Yep. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, basically our status of our numbers of our capital renewal, renewal program. I did include um, the past three allocation years, uh, the budgets that were originally given for each uh, fiscal year. And um, so what we're showing in the right-hand column is the percentage spent based on funds that were allocated. So our uh, FY 2020 year, we have 90% of those um, funds have been spent, but ultimately 100% of those projects are completed. FY21, 87% of the funds have been spent, and I think we've got three projects maybe not completed yet out there just finishing up. And for FY22, 77% of the funds have been spent. Um, attached in your packets, you should see a project list of all of those detailed projects for the past three years. So I have... Question? Just a quick question yeah. for you. With the remaining funds, those you get to roll over in the future fiscals and Absolutely. Help, help with the Debbie Smith or these other issues, correct? Exactly. They can roll over. Um, 
they can roll over into other maintenance right. funds. Um, I'm not so sure major projects can be used for those. They just get rolled over into our maintenance, into the capital renewal, and the next one on the list would take the money up. So we just keep on moving down the list. Okay. So we do have a short uh, video that communications creates for us, um, usually in the fall, so that uh, help highlight the uh, revitalization projects that happened last summer. You can play your role video. Can you do that, or do I do that? <laughs> oh, I do it. That's right. Why don't you give it a shot? Mm, no, it's not live. Okay. If you convert it, hmm? if you convert it to the PowerPoint. Oh, it's, yeah, no video today. We'll, we'll attach it and send it out yeah. so you guys can watch it. So um, just a word about change orders. There's very few projects that we don't at least have one change order, it seems like. Um, so all of our co projects that are um, over $100,000 that go out to formal bid, we do attach what we call a contingency or a change or a force account to that for 15% um, for unforeseen. Um, our average change orders over the past three years have been between 3 and 4%, so um, that's really a pretty good average for change orders. I think in the commercial world, between 3 and 5 is probably pretty typical, um, and I count that too improved uh, construction documents and making sure that we don't have any um, scope creep during projects. And again, there is an attachment um, of all those change orders if you would like to review those. So switching over to our major projects, I'm sure that you all know that we opened New Hook High School this year and at New O'Brien Middle School. And we did wrap up our scope expansion and remodel. That was a three uh, three year, three phase project. So that was a monster. And we're really glad to see that project completed. Um, our current projects underway are J. Wood Raw Elementary, which is the new elementary school that's in South Reno, due to open this fall. And Debbie Smith Career Technical Education, that currently is under demo right now because that is at the old Hug High School site. And then we'll be starting construction on the new buildings for that uh, project uh, this spring in just a month or two, right? Our upcoming projects that do we do anticipate coming uh, to this uh, committee for um, funding approval later this year that Adam already, I think, talked about is our central transportation modernization project and Stonebrook Elementary, um, which is also in design and uh, probably Vaughn as well. So this is our major projects program. Um, this shows the status of the projects. Um, which we really just talked about the previous slide. And um, the funding, the al original allocations and what's been committed so far. So this is all since WC1 was approved and uh, that amount now is 806, over $806 million. So, um, you know, it's really kudos to the community and to this committee for uh, getting us to the point of contributing all these funds to, to the schools. So in conclusion, our capital projects team has designed, managed, and constructed over 400 projects in 2022. Um, that includes two new schools. And quite frankly, I cannot stress enough how, what a big deal that is. That's a lot of projects. Um, we have five planners on staff, and we have approximately seven project managers in construction. And so any of those people at any given time are managing between 40 and 60 projects. So I'm really proud of all the work everybody's accomplished. That also includes our environmental department, um, our safety department, our maintenance department. They, you know, everybody helps to get a project out the door because we're always leaning on them for information as well to help get these projects done. So moving forward, um, just want to talk a little bit about our facility modernization plan. I'm sure you have all heard about that. Um, that's been going on and that will give us a path to our new um, school projects upcoming, hopefully, you know, in our core schools mainly. We do have a mechanical, electrical, and plumbing assessment going on that we're looking at um, some software platforms with as well to help us improve um, 
those projects and how we select them moving forward. And we are evaluating some project management software too, um, so that all of Capital Projects has a, a the same platform that we're working from and creates some consistencies and efficiencies within our department. Um, that's really about it. So does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions, Chicago? On your 406, was that all the publicly bid ones, or is that your under 100 and over? All. So that's zero to okay. major projects all the way through. That's an impressive amount of projects. It's impressive. Um, you'll notice in the attached project list mm -hmm. uh, that you know you're not going to see 406 projects listed. What you the example I wanted to give is uh, like for our boiler chiller projects, our um, personal hygiene projects, those are 30, 40 site projects sometimes. So that's why, that's where that number is coming from. So even though, look, even though it says personal hygiene, it's like 30 sites. So it can be. Okay, go ahead. Uh, with your upcoming, your central transportation stone work, are you guys doing design to build with that? Or are you looking at same or? Hard bit. Hard bit. Okay. For both of those. Questions of staff? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you or Adam's best to ask. Um, I know in the Stonebrook Elementary, we're on pause pending enrollment. So will we know on count day in September? And we're just kind of gearing up right now for the possibility that we will need to start, you know, give a green light to that. Uh, I guess what I'm looking for is a date. Is that going to be the end of September? So we're looking at even before that, infinite campus information before that and the first day of school, even though we know out there they'll be enrolled and they typically don't move, but we'll be looking at that, as well as the different scope at Stonebrook because it's not a pad ready site to see what that time frame means because that's work that has to be done that didn't have to be done at J. Wood Raw. So we're comparing those to see when we really need to start that and when we need to make that decision in order to get it open for that, that opening time frame. And remind me again what our target is. If we get the green light and we know we've got to go, are we two years? It's it's a two year, approximately a two year. Right. We typically start them in December, January with grading, and if that makes 18 months. But if we start in August or September ish and get that out to bid in October, we get a few more months to get that pad ready, is kind of what we're thinking at this point because it is a little bit added scope from what we had before. But we'll see what that says when it comes into Infinite Campus and what we look at with, with the area out there as well and the time frame. Okay, thank you. Scott, this is more of a statement. Just kudos to you guys. Is, is looking at the value of the money in last year's projects, you're talking $193 million that was put back into our schools for our community and our children. Yeah. But this is also to our community because every contractor I work on this is a family here in this town. So this is two investments in our community not only in the kids, but in our contractors and our families that have these children attending the schools. So for me, this is a big deal for our entire community in this valley. It's a win on both fronts. So kudos to you guys for getting this out, getting this work out, you know, we're keeping people employed and making money and, and helping our children. So good job. Thank you. I also want to mention, you know, your first slide, transparency and accountability. And I've always said this about the school district, specifically with these projects that you've got in all these different schools. Our community knows exactly what needs to happen within the schools based on the good work that you all have done with your um, your FICUS program and, and really understanding the, the condition of the schools. So I want to make sure I, I put that again on the record. I think that. Uh, uh, you guys have been beat up in the past, but I think uh, really uh, the information that's available for our entire community to understand the quality of the schools as they exist, that you know what needs to be repaired and that you've got a process to go through, I think is, uh, is admirable, admirable, and I say that as a former facility manager uh, from Washoe <laughs> County, uh, knowing, knowing what it takes. So thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments from the board? This is an action item, so I'm going to ask if there's any public comment. There's no public comment. All right. I'll bring it back to the board, and uh, I would entertain a motion. I would move to uh, recommend that we uh, 
approve the 2022 Capital Improvement Program Annual Accountability Report and pass along to Washoe County School District Board of Trustees. Second. A motion by Anderson, a second by Reese. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That will take us on to item number 2.04, which is a presentation and discussion on the current project schedule and budgeted costs associated with the future Debbie Smith Career and Technical Education Academy High School. Looks like Ms. Zimmerman is gonna walk us through this one. Thank you, Chairman Solero. For the record, Tammy Zimmerman, Deputy, or Dep, not Deputy, Chief Facilities <laughs> Management Officer. Just rolls off the tongue still, so sorry. Um, so really want to give you guys an update. It's been a while since I've been here to talk to you about Debbie Smith, but I um, want to walk you through where we were last spring because a lot of you, some of you weren't on this panel um, and just want to make sure that I give you the whole story and catch you up. So bear with me for a second. In February of 2022, we came to the Capital Funding Protection Committee and received approval for $125 million overall construction budget for that. Um, with the 112 million being just for construction and the rest being for our, our oversight and FF&E. In May, we bid it with Q&D Construction, who is our CMAR contractor for this, um, and we received a draft GMP that was 142 million, almost 143 million at that time, without even our contingency on it. So it exceeded what we had approved for construction. So then we came back to you guys in, this is, in June um, with some options. We had three different options and the option that was chosen was to move forward and do something and phase it so that we could get this open for our students because there are opportunities that our students need at this career technical education facility. And with that, it allowed us to, to we still were gonna do some construction in 2022, which we did. We kept our promise and did demolition and abatement um, and that was estimated at 15 million but we actually awarded it at $7.8 million. So we saved some money. I did take a change order to the board for some more abatement, but we're still well under what that estimate was before. So we felt really good about that moving forward. Um, and then it also allowed for value engineering and some scope identification. We did remove the boardroom from that because it, it just wasn't needed at that time at that space. Um, and so we, we took that off of there. And so we did a little bit of redesign. We had to spend a little bit of money to do some of that redesign, but it'll, it'll prove in the pudding when we actually bid it, hopefully, right, when we get to that. So um, it allows for, for some financial adjustments with that. Um, it, does, it did require rebidding of some of it, and we're rebidding what we call GMP1 right now and getting ready to bring that to the board for approval. Um, we knew that maybe market conditions could worsen, but what we're seeing now is maybe they're getting a little bit better um, and we're getting some better numbers. So that's, right? <laughs> we're getting there. Um, it did delay the full opening though, right? And that was, that was disappointing because our students need this facility. So taking advantage of that, um, there was some comments back when we, came, we were out to you guys for those <coughs> options about escalation. So we worked collaboratively with q and Construction and some of their subcontractors' information to put together escalation language. The escalation language that we have is that the district will accept the first 10%, um, but they have to ask, they have to submit for that in a sealed envelope um, shortly after their bid period, after they get the, the award from q and Construction for that. And then, if they do actually need it, we go and take their sealed envelope and open it and determine what their material price was at the time and what their escalation. So it puts a little bit of onus on them to actually get it. Um, and I'm happy to say we had a lot of good feedback from contractors in this GMP that we're, we're working through right now and none of the low bidders actually asked for escalation. So maybe it, you know they didn't put it in their price because it's within our budget, but they actually we actually partnered with them. So. We'll, we'll see how that works out in our GMP2 with the bigger scope because the site utilities is a much smaller scope. We did some bidding of early procurement items, switch gear. We put that into the site and utilities so that we could get that ahead of time and get it going and in line for that manufacturing. So that helped us to do that and mitigate that risk of not having switch gear on time. Um, 
it limited the risk with even just insurance and builders risk with contractors because it limits the time frames they have to carry the contracts for so that's the lessons learned for us in and trying to put it in one GMP and then spread it out into phases for us because we can limit that risk for them as well as us um, we also had some contractors who were bidding but then ended up over their bid limits and it allowed them time to go in and raise their bid limits and then actually bid this work so we had really good competition So you talk, I talked about demolition. We started that in the fall. We'll finish that here in April. And then we're going to actually be starting the site utility package in April right on those heels so that we can have Q&D on site and not have a vacancy doing that work. Um, we're, they've actually bid it. We have a draft GMP. They've got a few things to work out, but it's, it's well within this estimate that we had on there to begin with. And that included the um, switch gear that we added to that, even beyond that. So we actually feel like we got a really good price for all of that. The new building and existing building renovations, that'll start, uh, we'll start putting that out to bid here in April, and we're going to actually award that in July. Um, and then we're going to actually hard bid the landscaping portion and manage that ourselves so we can help save some of that um, over oversight expense. So with that, if you put all these together, we're going to be, based off the, the initial estimates we've received and, and heard, we're going to be asking for additional funding. And that a lot of that is to take care of the escalation that we may be incurring. We don't know what it's going to be, um, so we have to plan for it and budget for it. And that's why you'll see some of that extra expense in there, um, as well as we plan on putting in some more owner contingencies so that we can take care of those unforeseen because as we've learned in our demolition phase, we found some unforeseen items and we want to cover those. That doesn't mean we spend it, but we have to have it in the bucket and approved in order to take care of those items if we need to. So that would, we would be coming back potentially for an augmentation of about 26 to $29 million to complete this. I think that's it. Have any questions? Any questions from the Zoom? Scott, with your augmentation, does that impact anything else you see that you have on the plate? Potential. Potential projects in that? Yeah. Um, it could. Um, I feel very confident in our CIP plan that we're we're modeling right now that we can still do what we want to do. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Schlinger. Ms. Zimmerman, I was wanted to circle back to a comment you made about the redesign which uh, apparently did not include then an expanded boardroom do you remember that comment correct so let, let me understand the thinking there because you said sort of parenthetically that it was not needed at this time so i'm fundamentally una unaware and perhaps because i'm not educated enough to know uh, what the need is but I have consistently during my time on this committee been critical of the district's facility planning from the standpoint of its needs. The district has been incredibly good about using the WC1 monies to create new opportunities for our students. And I'm worried that we are not thinking long-term about our, about our staff, the folks in this particular facility that we're sitting in now. And this seems another example of that. I mean, long term, is there a plan? What, what, what are we going to do with the needs of the district from a district's facility plan? So I think you'll be surprised. We are we are not ignoring the, the need for a new boardroom. And that, that setting was just not the right setting for it. When you're trying to manage a high school and then have board meetings, that high schools happen, have activities at all hours, and then a board meeting, it just doesn't mesh real well. So that's really the reason for not needing it at that site. It's not that we don't need one, and I think you know, as in the future, we are we are thinking about that, and we do worry about the people in this facility and the boardroom and all that. Um, but that'll come in time. And if part of my inquiry is to support the needs of the district, right? It's not to be critical of your efforts. I think you are undertaking incredible work and doing it. I think in a way that we can all be proud of as a community. So kudos to you and your team and, and all the planners involved. Um, I just want to make certain that uh, sort of we are sort of like the cobblers, children have no shoes kind of thing. I, I want to make sure that the needs of the district are being met long term. And because 
my whole life we've been in this building and, and now that's quite a long while. Um, I also saw something sort of interesting, uh, again, related, but mm -hmm. it looks like the area around um, Vaughan and some of our schools in the Wells District are, I think, ultimately going to see some changes as the VA moves their location, which has been announced. So I, I want to sort of put on the radar screen a, a thought bubble that says, hey, if the VA is pitching out of that location there, we have some great school sites there in that neighborhood. Uh, maybe this is the time for us to really think out loud about that site as potentially the home of a new district facility. Um, obviously, that facility is aging and, and, and I think ultimately has to be torn down. But the commitment to that neighborhood could be very incredible as we <coughs> seek to rebuild um, some of our older schools in that neighborhood, which we're doing. Um, and you think about where Wooster is, and, and so you have a lot going on there, and so I just want us to be thinking and dreaming a bit out loud and, and, and sort of said bigly um, about it. So thank you. Any other? Mr. Agri. Thank you, Justin Agri, for the record. Um, I'd like to circle back to the escalation clause. You say some of the contractors actually didn't submit for escalation some of the subcontractors <coughs> some of the subcontractors the subcontracts for our gmp1 that were the selected subcontractors did not submit for escalation within their pricing okay they and had then, an option to but they also can take advantage of stored materials which then helps them and so some of them that was kind of the feedback we had is they're we're going to store materials we're going to allow them to store them on site and help them in that fashion Pre pay for them once they get yeah okay and then the only other thing I want to make sure is in our escalation clause it works both ways right so when they give you that sealed envelope if you have to open that sealed envelope if the numbers have gone down they have to give money back is that correct that's correct yeah, it, so. it is very hard to calibrate that with the right. with the CIP you know all of that um, but we're going to do our darnest to actually calibrate that and, and make it fair okay perfect thank you any other questions, comments? Great. Thank you very much for the information. I really appreciate that. Uh, that'll take us on to item number 2.05, which is information and discussion on the proposed city of Reno stormwater impact fee ordinance. Uh, Mr. Sturcy. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon again, Adam Searcy for the record. This one doesn't have a visual. There was an attachment associated with this item, really just an impact statement from the district. This, this topic was requested on the agenda from a couple members. Many of you have likely uh, been made aware of the active uh, business impact statement process that the city of Reno is currently engaged in um, related to this proposed fee ordinance. Um, and really, uh, the school district is working in close partnership with city staff and leadership um, to identify uh, not only the impact to the school district, but discuss some of the unique aspects of the school district and how this ordinance might be best suited to address the school district's unique position within the community. All that said, you know, that process is ongoing and it's, it's, we're working well in collaboration together. Um, I think the, the real question relative to this committee um, that we wanted to be clear about is that the capital revenues are exclusively available for uh, capital projects or f facility, permanent facility investments, not available for use on ongoing operating expenses. So this would be very analogous to a sewer, uh, monthly sewer bill or a monthly uh, utility bill of any kind, uh, which would not be able to be fulfilled or spent uh, by any capital funds. So that's really all I wanted to share on this item. Uh, if you guys have any questions or would like to discuss, that'd be great. Any questions? Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Searcy, can you tell this committee, does Washington County School District currently pay a similar uh, stormwater fee or tax to Washoe County or to the city of Sparks? And how much is that, if they do? Uh, both the City of Sparks and Washoe County have 
stormwater impact fees, they're very different uh, in their format and they're very different in their scale uh, to what's proposed by the city of Reno. Um, but we do pay, we're not exempt in, within the confines of the way it's constructed, the county and city of Sparks, uh, the school district participates in those fees as well. Do you think given your legal analysis of that recent court case you cited that possibly you could be exempt if it meets the definition of a tax rather than a fee? And so there could be some future savings to the district? I couldn't speculate beyond what uh, was cited in that letter to be, to be candid. Okay, um, moving on, I, some of your suggestions I, I think are good ones. The, the CPI concerns I think are really valid. Um, there should at least be a cap. Um, I would suggest a, another change, and that would just be to push back implementation, urge the city to at least 2024. Um, you know, a lot of fiscal year budgets are already closed, and under the this currently drafted proposal from the city, it would start July 1st of this year. Um, and so doing it in the middle of a, of a budget cycle is concerning. That money is already allocated in other places. Um, but for me, honestly, there, there, there's two things. Um, I, I see a double standard being proposed by the city. Um, when it comes to rights of way, the city has exempted itself um, from having to pay uh, the new fee on rights of way that are maintained by the city but the school district maintains rights of way. Um, a, a lot of individual parcels maintain rights of way. And I think if the city is gonna exempt itself, it should offer that exemption um, to other parcels that also have to maintain rights of way. But my, my number one concern is where uh, on the crediting process, the school district can teach about water conservation um, and stormwater as part of its curriculum and then it receives uh, an, an abatement of what it has to pay on those fees. It, that looks a lot like a municipal governing body is dictating to our school district what is being taught in the schools. And I'm just not comfortable with that at all. Um, you know, teaching them about stormwater is pretty benign, but what it does is it sets a precedence where the city could come back with another fee uh, in the future and says, the only way you can get out of paying this fee is if you teach this certain course to students. And it, it could be a course that's totally inappropriate for students to learn about. But the city is, you know, forcing the school district into a choice of whether to teach this course or to pay the new fee. So um, it's more of a comment than a question. And we have two council members here from the city of Reno. And I know this is gonna come in front of them, but this is uh, just a heads up for when you guys start your deliberations. Thank you. Any other comments for Mr. Searcy? All right, seeing none. Thanks, sir, for putting that on the agenda and giving us the, the letter that you provided to the city of That'll take us on to item 2.06, which is the presentation and discussion update on the agreed upon procedures external review of professional services of the capital improvement program. Mr. Stark. Good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. Rick Starkey, Chief Internal Auditor for the record. Uh, I'll start with a little background on this item because it hasn't been a, been a little while since we're, I was back up here. But uh, a while back, this committee requested an audit of the policies, procedures, and processes the Capital Projects Department uses to manage the construction professional service providers such as architects, engineers, and design firms. Initially, we worked with a couple members of the committee to scope out the project its objectives and desired and proposed procedures. Later on, I presented the proposed uh, project particulars to the district's audit committee, who also approved the project and then uh, did so with the board where they agreed to authorize the necessary monies for the third party to perform the work. In mid-October, our office sent out an RFQ that requests for a quote to four firms who offer um, extensive experience and expertise in performing these types of industry-specific reviews. The four firms were ProTivity, BDO, Baker Tilly, and Stone Turn. By late November, we had received proposals from each of the firms, which was really good. Um, after some discussions with the firms, I'm pleased to report we selected BDO to perform the work. BDO has been around for over 100 years, operating throughout the country, and also has a renal office. 
The firm provides accounting and advisory services in a range of businesses and industry, including, including education and construction. The team performing this specific project consists of experienced construction auditors and subject matter experts with engineering backgrounds. The contract is set up to not exceed $80,000, which includes any travel costs that may be necessary to come to the area. With no travel, the, uh, the project cost should, should obviously decrease. Uh, currently, the contract is with the firm's legal department and has been for a few weeks. I was told they were extensively backlogged and uh, are getting to it as soon as they can. But as soon as we have an okay with their legal department, we can get the contract processed. And as soon as we have the contract in place, we'll plan to begin shortly thereafter. Um, and thank you for your time on this. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Starkey on the Mr. Avery. So I didn't see anything in the packet today. Okay. Is there a chance you can just get me the the criteria in which they're going to? So I, I'd just I rather be out ahead of it. If I see something that that doesn't look quite right, I just I'd rather be ahead of it than behind it. You got it. Yeah. Just just as a heads up, it's basically the same exact um, uh, setup that we had uh, as part of the I think it was in April to the capital funding committee. We basically took that um, proposal and took that to the audit committee, and then when that was okayed, the proposed budget was put onto a, uh, to the board for okay. Well, I will definitely get it to you. The only thing that changed is, I think in the original one that came to this committee, we were gonna select a sample, let's say four to five, at least four to five, and we upped it to five to six when we sent it out uh, for a quote. But I'll, I'll definitely get it to you, you got it. Appreciate that. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, any other questions on this item? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you forward to the future information. All right, that'll take us on to item 3.01, closing public comment. Is there any public comments? There's no public comments. All right. Um, item 3.02, our next meeting will be April 6, 2023, and I believe you've all probably got this already on your calendar. Uh, so uh, thank you for getting that uh, out to us ahead of time. Appreciate that. Um, and then um, we will move on to item 3.03, which is adjournment. And this meeting is adjourned.